tell a story about a nightmare. The crocodiles were an interesting part of my American waka waka when I crisscrossed the United States in the course of a recent visit. Did I come close to being eaten up by crocodiles? Well, you will have to wait until I get to that part of the story. Meanwhile, let's begin with my arrival. Many airports look the same at night, so it was not until I was on my way into the city that I began to discover some of the mystery of Miami, Florida. Given the dazzling array of luxury yachts and boats anchored in some of the city's numerous harbors, it is not easy to get beyond the stereotyped image of Miami as a playground for rich folks crisscrossed by gleaming superhighways. A mere two-hour drive away from the city center, however, the Florida Everglades provide a very different vision of this part of the United States of America. I'm in the Florida Everglades. It's a beautiful expanse of land which has been preserved for nature. That is how I ended up at a crocodile farm, watching these creatures from a safe distance. I can't really say if crocodiles and birds manage to coexist peacefully in Florida, but it is obvious that local authorities here have gone to a lot of trouble to preserve nature in the Everglades. Since I wasn't about to jump into the swamp to swim with the crocodiles, I did the next best thing, which was to join other tourists in a boat powered by aircraft engines to travel through the swamps. Soon, we were cruising at top speed through the swamps. At the end of a pleasurable airboat ride through part of the Everglades, I made my way to the Seminole Indian Reservation nearby. I was eager for an insight into authentic American history. As is well known, Indians were the original population of America. The Seminole Indian lifestyle is very similar to the African traditional way of life in many respects as I discovered when I visited the Seminole Indian village that is part of the museum in the Everglades.
Tell me who you are, madam, and uh, where you live and all that. My name is uh, Linda Beletso. I live here in Big Cypress Reservation. I'm um, a member of a Seminole tribe. I make baskets. I'm uh, the famous Seminole basket maker in the tribe. And uh, I work here at the uh, Tati Museum Village. Thank you very much for talking with mm -hmm. me. I'm from Nigeria. Oh, oh okay. Yes, Oh yeah, you're a long ways from home. All right, so please say hello to the people of Nigeria. Hi. All right, thank you. My name. What? See, my, my people call me like that. <laughs> they call you like how? Before the high sea. Oh, no. That's what they call me. My people. All right. All right. And white people call me George. Uh huh. The same thing, but my language is. So, so, so. Good evening, sir. Uh, you don't know. We don't know. Right. Right. So, you are George in English? Yes. Can you tell me your name in Seminole? Ola Hashi. Osola Hashi. Ola Hashi. And I find that our cultures are very similar. You know, you have a lot of things, you know, this, the hats here, everything, it looks like Africa. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I hope one day you have the opportunity of coming to visit us sure. and see what we must like. be, but I'm afraid to go in there. There's a lot of crocodiles in there. But you have crocodiles here, too. <laughs> <laughs> I ran into more crocodiles when I visited an amazing museum run by the Seminole themselves. For hours, I wandered among life-size wax figures that show how the Seminoles lived traditionally in their villages before the land was overrun by the invaders from overseas who now occupy most of North America. There was much to ponder here. What would America have been like today if the land had not been forcibly seized by armed immigrants from Europe who killed and marginalized most of the prior inhabitants of the continent? In Florida, the Seminole Indians waged a desperate war of survival against U.S. armed forces in partnership with runaway slaves of African origin with whom they intermarried. remarkable film that is on display in the Seminole Museum tells the story of this long struggle during which the Seminole Indians and their African allies waged a successful guerrilla war from deep within the swamps for several decades.
Later, one of my newfound Seminole friends summed up the Seminole legacy of resistance to the invaders. They moved about. Every time there was, there was a little place and they see a hunter, a white hunter, come by and they, they would move from one location to another. Yeah. Well, somebody might come yeah. So, you know, a lot of people were like that. They were kind of skittish. And this is one of the biggest areas where they finally located as a community before it was recognized as a Seminole tribe. So a lot of those stories kind of faded out and a lot of stories at that time, back about a uh, hundred years ago, um, there, there was a time where the government came in and said, we'll give you this sack of money if you leave this land and you go to a, a place over in Oklahoma, a right. place called Oklahoma. And uh, they agreed. And they took that sack of money and they got on the ship and they left. Yeah. So, but these people, this band here, were the ones who refused to leave and said that. And what that means is, we're the people who fought and came here, and we're the people of this land, and we live here. And this is where we're going to stay. This is where we stand. We'll keep the fight going in order to survive here. And this is where they stay. And that's what that means. And uh, that's uh, so the people who left were the ones who gave up. And they said they sold their spirits. So they, they look at them as dead people over there in Oklahoma. You know, the Seminoles, they say Seminoles. But, you know, we see them as, you know, people who surrendered and left us with a battle. All too soon, it was time for me to leave Florida. I flew out of Miami, my mind filled with many revelations from the past, traveling through landscapes and clouds over which the ghosts of the valiant Seminole and African warriors seemed to hover. My next stop was New York City, where the Manhattan District, which is the heart of New York, seems to be a coming together of many different pieces of a huge electronic billboard on which advertisements for several different products jostle endlessly to capture attention. When I went down into the subway, one of my first adventures was an intriguing encounter with a fellow Nigerian who was preaching a bizarre new religious doctrine. Like Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, believe the Lord Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. We don't serve as a Maria as Jesus Christ. We have no right whatsoever to serve her as God. You got to take care of your mother. You got to obey your father and your mother. That's our Jewish culture in Igbo Jewish land. The remnants of Jacob. There are many black Jews here and in Africa. And we're supposed to get and along. Of the closing doors, please. Black and white Jews are supposed to get along. Black and white Jews can marry one another. Black and white Jews can make peace all over the world. Black and white Jews must always exist. No more racism, monarchical system in America. No more. 110. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. The Dominican men are learning how to live with their By night, 
the Manhattan district metamorphoses into a fascinating visual melody of twinkling lights. Much as I enjoyed wandering through Manhattan at night, I was anxious to seek out Harlem, where most of the black population of New York is concentrated. Contrary to the false stereotypes that are constantly being propagated by Western news media about Harlem, particularly in the United States itself, I've always found Harlem to be a fascinating setting filled with churches and bubbling with varied musical and artistic activities. On this occasion, my visit to Harlem thrust me back into delicious memories of a summer I spent in Harlem some years ago, when I was privileged to witness a fabulous parade inspired by black pride in the African-American cultural heritage. As different associations and groups paraded along the streets of Harlem, showing off a wide variety of well-choreographed dance steps, it was as if Marcus Garvey had suddenly come back to life again, galvanizing black people all over the world to recognize their common heritage. Better proof does one need that Africans at home, Africans abroad, Africans in the black diaspora all over the world are culturally one. And if we are all one from a cultural point of view, why can't we be one from a political point of view? 
as the great thinkers of the contemporary black race, like Marcus Garvey, like Malcolm X, like Kwame Nkrumah, like Patrice Lumumba, have so strongly pointed out. Fortunately, no one needs to tell young black people that the black race is one. It is in their genes, so they manifest it in their music, in their creativity, in their dance steps. Perhaps the day will come also when they will manifest this unity of the black race in their political activities. Thank <laughs> you.